a long-awaited study by the International Agency for Cancer Research, an arm of the World Health Organization, is now in the midst of peer review for publication. The Interfon study is the name given to a series of multinational case control studies, to assess whether RF exposure from mobile phones is associated with cancer risk. The multi-million dollar telecom-funded Interfon data collection from 13 countries was completed in 2004. Publication has been repeatedly delayed to such a point that the European Parliament declared the delay was deplorable. There have been 14 interphone studies with partial results published. Surprisingly, the dominant finding of all 14 studies was that use of a cell phone protects the user from a brain tumor. Immediately this tells you there's something wrong here. There are two possible conclusions that can be drawn from this unlikely finding. One, either using a cell phone does provide protection from a brain tumor, or two, the study design is fundamentally flawed. With the identification of 11 design flaws, there is good evidence to support the second of the two possible conclusions, as the most likely. The flaws, that result in an underestimation of the risk of brain tumors, include selection bias, insufficient latency time to expect a tumor diagnosis, unrealistic definition of regular cell phone use, Exclusion of children and young adults from the study. Selecting mostly metropolitan areas to locate brain tumor cases. Treating study subjects who used a cordless phone, as unexposed, to microwave radiation. Exclusion of many types of brain tumors. Failing to distinguish between tumors inside and outside the radiation plume. Exclusion of people who had died, or were too ill to be interviewed as a consequence of their brain tumor. Asking users to recall their cell phone use, instead of examining the billing records. Funding by entities, with financial interest. The effect of these design flaws, is a systematic skewing of all results, meaning the true risk is larger than the published risk. The authors disguised their statistically significant protective results, by stating there was no risk, of brain tumor or cancer, from cell phone use, instead of communicating the actual results obtained. The names of the persons responsible for these design flaws have not been made public so they could be questioned about why these design choices were made. These studies are funded, by an entity with a financial interest in the findings. It has been shown, more often than not, the findings of such a study are favorable to the financial interest, compared to independently financed studies. This phenomenon, known as funding bias, is common and occurs across many industries. A substantial portion of the Interphone study funding comes from the cell phone industry. For European studies, industry has provided more than $4.5 million, Another $1 million came from the Canadian Wireless Telecommunications Association, and it is unknown if industry funding has been provided for studies in Japan, Australia and New Zealand. In addition to the $4.5 million, the Interphone Exposure Assessment Committee received an unknown amount of funding from UK network operators and French network operators. The French study received an unknown amount of funding from Orange, SFR, and Briggs Playcom. The UK study received an unknown amount of funding from O2, Orange, T-Mobile, and Vodafone. And the Danish study received an unknown amount of funds from the International Epidemiology Institute. One cell phone company employed at least one member of the Interphone Committee, Dr. Joe Weert, from France Telecom. Even though three of five studies had telecom industry funding, all five studies found some amount of elevated risks for brain tumors, including a 20% increased risk for every year of cell phone use. In a March 2009 paper, Electromagnetic Fields and DNA Damage, all the studies from exposure to radio frequency radiation, regarding cellular DNA damage, was reviewed. 14 studies showed significant effects, and 17 studies did not find significant effects. Dr. Odi Roti, was funded by Motorola, and is an author on 8, of the 17 no significant effect papers. The blood-brain barrier protects the brain from many molecules that are toxic to the brain. Professor Leif Selford, of the Department of Neurosurgery from Lund University in Sweden, has shown that cell phone radiation, results in leakage of the blood-brain barrier. The highest leakage occurs at lower exposure levels, and decreases for higher exposure levels. Professor Selford's study clearly showed that blood-brain barrier leakage killed neurons in the brain of exposed rats. His findings are of major concern, because one of many potential outcomes of blood-brain barrier leakage, is dementia. 
The interphone protocol requires subjects to be between 30 and 59 years of age. There is strong evidence that the young adults and children are at greater risk from exposure to carcinogens than mature adults, suggesting that the young, with greater cell growth, are more vulnerable to genetic mutations. Children's heads and brains are not miniature adult heads. Their skulls are thinner. The proportion of water is higher. Myelin is still developing. As a result, the cell phone radiation penetrates a far larger proportion of the brain. An Israeli study found that children who were exposed when they were younger than 5 years had a 356% increased risk. Children between 5 and 10 had a 224% increased risk. And those over 10 had a 47% increased risk of a brain tumor. Risk increases as the age decreases. But the age of exposure has no effect on latency time. Whether children or adults, the latency time between first exposure and brain tumor diagnosis remains the same, about 30 years. Men, and particularly teenage boys, place their cell phone in the pants pockets when they are not holding it to their heads in conversation. There are multiple studies showing deleterious effects on sperm, including decreased sperm counts and reduced sperm motility. One study found a 59% decline in sperm count in men who used cell phones for four or more hours per day. Another study reported an 80% increased risk of testicular cancer, developing in pattern with the preferred pocket. There have not been a single cell phone study on female fertility. In 2004, the second interphone study to be published raised considerable alarm when it reported a nearly 300% increased risk of acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma results will not be included, as a complete set of the ruined interphone data on acoustic neuromas has yet to be circulated. Five years has gone by since the full set of acoustic neuroma data has been available, but it has yet to be circulated. Telecom-funded studies have been reporting highly questionable results, in comparison with independent studies that consistently show there is a significant risk of brain tumors from cell phone use. Industry responds to independent studies, by casting doubt on the validity of them. When the independent studies show results not favorable to those with a financial interest, an industry study quickly follows, casting doubt on the original study. The back and forth between independent and industry studies adds to the sense of doubt. It is a highly successful technique, used to neutralize alarming findings by independent science. It fatigues the mind to such an extent that few pay attention to what is going on. The telecom industry media statement, and similar messages, will do their best to cast doubt about the risk of brain tumors from wireless phone use. But the facts remain.